welcome everyone. It's, uh, yeah, it's great to see everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's, uh, you know, despite the, the, the program that was originally scheduled downstairs being canceled, thank you for coming to this uh, informal conversation. Um, in some ways, it feels great to be having it inside a space. So in some ways, I think it's worked out nicely. Um, and so let me just say a few words before we, we begin. So um, welcome to the conversation uh, with Deng Zentian and Salima Hashmi. Uh, I'm John Tain. For those of you who don't know, I'm John Tain, head of research at Asia Art Archive. And it's my distinct pleasure to welcome our two esteemed guests, Salima and Deng Zentian. Uh, and the program today sits at the intersection of two Asia Art Archive projects. One is the space around you, uh, translations, expansions, uh, the exhibition organized by AAA and currently on view uh, here in the Fried School as part of Documenta 15. Uh, the exhibition looks at three different forms of artist collectives involved with the preservation and transmission of knowledge, including, not surprisingly, an art school, the Faculty of Fine Arts at the University of Baroda, which you see which you see in this section of the room, okay? Okay, so um, <clears throat> the program also functions as an in-person extension of the Art Schools of Asia project. For those of you not familiar with it, Art Schools of Asia was, and it's very sad to think of it in the past tense, uh, it was a monthly seminar that ran from October of last year through May of this year. Uh, as well as an online symposium that took place in June, and that will be viewable online. It's a public uh, symposium. In addition to a roster of distinguished guest scholars, it included an inspiring cohort of 18 truly gifted emerging scholars from around the world, stretching a, a, across 19 time zones, I counted. Together, we were able to outline the invaluable contribution made by art schools and art education to the development of modern and contemporary art across Asia and beyond. We also teased out some of the broader methodological and theoretical implications that thinking about schools and education have for the writing of histories of art and institutions more broadly. As part of the Art Schools of Asia program run by Lumbong Artists uh, Asia Art Archive, us, uh, this conversation brings together Salima Hashmi to my left and Zen Sintian to my right, two artists who have been mentors to generations of younger artists since the 1960s, and who more recently were interlocutors with the seminar participants for Art Schools of Asia. They will share their experiences at the art academies they have taught at and discuss the intersections of learning and art making in their practice. So um, I, now I'm going to introduce them in the order in which they will present. In addition to being the daughter of renowned poet Faiz Ahmed Faiz, Salima Hashmi has a formidable reputation in her own right as an artist, writer, activist, and educator. She served as professor at the National College of Arts, Lahore, in Pakistan, for over three decades, and also as its principal in the 1990s. She studied design at the NCA shortly after it opened, and also art education at the Bath Academy of Art, after which she worked for a number of years with young children. In addition to working as an educator, she co-founded the Rotas Gallery in Islamabad, showing a mix of international and local artists who could not otherwise be shown. In 1983, she organized a group of women artists, uh, including Lala Rook and Ab uh, Abbasi Abidi, to draft and sign a manifesto as a resistance to the oppressive Zia regime, though it was only published years later in her book, Unveiling the Visible, Lives and Works of Women Artists of Pakistan. She has curated a number of exhibitions, including Hanging Fire, Contemporary Art from Pakistan, Asia Society, uh, which took place at Asia Society in 2008. And then next will be the artist Deng Sintian, who graduated from the oil painting department at the Hamzo Academy, today the China Academy of Art, in 1958, and himself, uh, who himself taught there for a number of decades, serving as a department chair in the 1980s. During his tenure, he established a book fair and expanded the library so that students would have access to material from outside China, which became a very popular feature of the school. Many of the artists uh, would go on to form the 85 New Wave, such as Zhang Peili and Huang Yongping, um, and, uh, as graduates of the program. After moving to Vancouver in 1990, then co-founded Center A, Vancouver International Center for Contemporary Asian Art in 1999, and Yi Su, uh, Journal of Contemporary Chinese Art, the first English magazine on contemporary Chinese art in 2002. 
He was a curator for the Shanghai uh, Biennale in 2004, among many exhibitions, other exhibitions. He is adjunct director of the Institute for Asian Art at the Vancouver Art Gallery. And before I hand uh, this very glitzy microphone over to Salima, uh, I wanted to thank Rangrupa and the documented team, and especially Nora Bed and Veronica Benzot, for all their help in making it possible for all of us to be here today. I would also like to express my appreciation to my AA colleagues, Osge Ersoy, Susanna Chung, Rebecca Tso, Leah Lam, Jung Dai Bo, uh, Sneha Raghavan, and many others. Without their support, it would not, today would not be possible. Last but not least, I would like to thank the Getty Foundation and to Miguel Babaca, who happens to be here, uh, miraculously is able to be here with us today in the flesh. Through the support offered by the Connecting Art Histories Initiative, it became possible to envisage bring together this extraordinary and talented cohort of scholars together for the art schools of Asia and to put them in contact with many other scholars and artists as well. It has been clear to all of us who participate in, in the program what a difference it has made to all of our thinking and after many months of online meetings, it has been such a joy to see everyone here together. In the conversation today and the workshop tomorrow, we hope to share some of that joy and brilliance with you. So without further ado, I'm going to pass the mic to Salima. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hi. I'm Salima, and uh, I'm very old. And I've been an artist for a very short period of a time. And I have been a teacher for far longer a period of time. Um, I'm afraid that you know you're going to have to really imagine a lot of images. But I hope some of you will be able to see the laptops, and others will be following it on your own devices. Um, I'm going to rush you through a historical survey of evolving pedagogies in art education in Pakistan. And I just want to show you the first image uh, to let you know how far we have come. Uh, it's an image of, uh, can I go on to the first image, please? Uh, it's, a, it's a miniature which shows patron and artist of the 18th century, in which the great artist, Nenso, miniature painter, is leaning forward eagerly uh, as his patron, Balwen Singh, the Raja, is looking at it and presumably is being educated by the artist in the niceties of what he's looking at. Of course, the artist himself had the mentoring of some master or the other. And this is, I want to show this is the first image because it, it talks about the intimacy between firstly, the, the student who's now a great master, Nancy, and his patron. And there is this direct connection between one and the other, and the transmission of knowledge goes from the, the, the guru to the to teacher, and then on to the patron. So there is this very close connection between them. If I can have the next image very quickly. Just a close up of, of the same. And you can feel the anxiety of the artist. Um, and also, there is a kind of, uh, a slight smugness uh, with the patron, but also, I think, a realization that he's looking at something very, very special. Next, please. Um, and then, of course, there's colonization. And suddenly, from that intimate relation, there becomes a standardization of handing down what became, eventually, the art education model, where you have Lockwood Kipling, the principal of the Mayo School of Arts in Lahore, and on the the other side, you have the logo of the art school. So from an uh, intimate relationship, it now becomes something far more distant to be standardized and given over to a large number of people. You've already decided what the curriculum is going to be by these images. While before, when the young artist used to be sent to the village master, the master taught him a lot of other things apart from learning the skills. There was probably some introduction to a bit of poetry. There was a little bit of introduction to the context in which they lived, how they were expected to behave in the future. All that is gone. It's replaced by a far more distant relationship. This is just an image of 
the faculty um, in the beginning of the 20th century at the Mayo School of Arts in Lahore. There are four art schools set up by the British in four important cities. The idea being that the industrial age in Britain had lost some of the finer niceties of craft and they felt the poet disappeared in India also. Perhaps the children of craftspersons could be given some uh, instruction. So there they are in the workshops, which served as studios. In the top image, you have little boys learning the craft of metalwork, something that they would have learned in their father's knee. But now it's standardized. And below, there is the introduction of that dreaded um, component, the blackboard, on which now they are given instructions as to how to proceed further. So there is now um, not that one-to-one, -one, but something quite different. And what I showed you was Lahore, Mayo School of Arts. A similar pattern was now taking place in other places. This is the Karachi School of Art um, in the early 60s. The girls are sitting down uh, to learn how to draw from a cast, a plaster cast. No longer that learning which comes from direct experience of the world at large, but something that has been ordained and probably came about a copy of something that came from South Kensington. Um, please notice the gender balance. I wonder if this continues in art schools today. Um, National College of Arts by this time, by the early 1960s, had taken on the Bauhaus way of uh, working out a curriculum. And there were definite studies in design, studies in fine art, studies in architecture, and then the overall overarching academics department feeding into these different path components of the art school or the art design and architecture school. There was, however, something a little bit different about National College of Arts or NCA as it's known across the world. It was that there was an understanding that there would be an interdependency between all of these areas of study. And of course, that was part of uh, the result of the foundation year, which everyone who has been through a formal art school knows of, but it was more acutely followed at NCA, which allowed a kind of, um, I would say, cross-pollination. Cross Next. A very quick look at some of the studios. Some people will recognize the way early still lives are taught. This is a study of light, in chiaroscuro, and um, tonal values. There is a printmaking department. There's a work outside, which is a large collage. There is life drawing as such. Um, I have to say that life drawing has seen its own vicissitudes in a country like Pakistan, where there was uh, extreme uh, religiosity, which was entertained, which came about as a result of Ziaul Haq's regime. And suddenly, uh, it was being questioned as to why they should be life drawing. Um, I myself was teaching a class in which suddenly there was a huge mob appeared and asked me what I was doing. And I said, I'm teaching life drawing. And they said, um, so they said, you know, do you, don't you think you should Islamize this? So I took the leader outside and very gently said that, yes, I totally agreed with him. But I had written out a letter to the medical school, not far away, asking them how they were Islamizing the teaching of anatomy. Mm. And as soon as I got an answer, I was going to do absolutely the same in my own studio. <laughs> they were deeply impressed, I have to say, with my seriousness of purpose. <laughs> um, but they also said, well, can't you have, I said, you know, this is the curriculum, so we have to teach. So they said, but could you not, um, could you not, uh, for example, get them to draw King Faisal of Saudi Arabia? So I said, well, actually, he's dead. <laughs> and it's not possible. Um, so they, were, they, they nodded and went off. And um, as I left, they said, but you could start calligraphy. And I said, well, you know, we've written to the government asking them for 600,000 
rupees so that we can start the department. Oh, they said, we will recommend it to the government. The money never came and the classes never started. Next. Um, very quickly, just some images of the NCA gallery, some of the works. Um, next. I think some of the more fun things that happen in an art school, and NCA is not different, is that when the students who are not in the formal studio are left alone to do some projects or uh, at some events, try their hand at working with in the context of the, the architecture in which they're doing. So these are images of uh, the dinner, the annual dinner in which students uh, decide to play around with the spaces that they have. Um, there is also the way that grading happens, and I think anybody who's an art educationist knows uh, the wretchedness of trying to figure out how students should be graded. Um, I personally have always been consumed by a feeling of guilt and of making, of feeling that perhaps uh, it's, a, it's an unfair system, whatever kind of system you devise. Um, this joint getting together is perhaps the best that one can do. What is interesting is, of course, when there's tremendous dissent between all the people who are teaching. And uh, at NCA and at BNU, which I was later part of, the Deakin House National University, one has tried more and more to make this into a seminar situation, the grading to become a seminar situation. So there is not too much emphasis put on things like who did this best, but rather what are the possibilities that arose out of a particular project and what are the various solutions or what are the various interpretations that can be put forward and how do you evaluate them with, together with your peers rather than leaving it to the exalted teacher to do. Um, when I joined the Beacon House National University, and there are two of our first batch here, as two students from Nepal who now live in Berlin, um, we thought that we would be going in for a more a radical revisiting of all the ways that we had been teaching art and design, and which made for some exciting moments. Uh, this is just an image that I'm showing you. It's a, it's a reference to a particular way of teaching the idea of light, for example. If you select a text, um, and then you get the students to go through the text and devise projects to which they work. I'll just read this little text. Um, it's on light, and it's writing by Furlock and Schneider. It says, ever since we crawled out of that primordial slime, that's been our unifying cry. More light, sunlight. Torchlight, candlelight, neon, incandescent lights that banish the darkness from our caves to illuminate our roads, the insides of our refrigerators, big flats for the night games at soldiers' feet, little tiny flashlights for those books we read under the covers when we are supposed to be asleep. Light is more than watts and foot candles. Light is metaphor. Light is knowledge. Light is life. Light is light. And when you work from a text like that, I think it allows the student to really, the freedom to arrive at any kind of a, an anchor from which to move forward. And I'm just showing you a quick, quick couple of images of um, some, some works that came out of this. These are, of course, very basic classes. Um, so, you know, you're using um, the, a pane of glass to attach paper to and it's translucent. So there's grades of light that come through. Thanks. Um, and then there is always the delight of shadows um, and what they do and whether you're working with five-year-olds or you're working with 15-year-olds or 25 years old, I think there's always that joy of discovery. Um, I'm just taking you through a couple of images at the Beacon House National University, which was looking at um, everyday objects, changing them around, next. Um, and the fact that you work on something in the studio, and then you take it out into a different context, and it becomes 
an object somewhat transformed by where it finds itself. Um, so the object also is capable of multiple interpretations. There are many moments, I think, in art education in which it's not necessary for there to be instruction, um, but more to do with experience. In a country like Pakistan, and when I speak in Asia, I'm very aware of the fact that we have such great uh, traditions of craft, and they, they definitely have to have a place in the making of any kind of objects. And therefore, the Industrial School of Art and Architecture in Karachi is one of those in which um, the craft and contemporary design uh, cohabit and are inspiration inspirational for students. Uh, they are looking at the possibility of imagination for the designer in a number of uh, other ways. All students who are studying textiles are required to spend time in the workshops of craftspersons so that they learn not just the process, but they learn the respect that it is to be afforded to the way people work. Um, and this finds its way into design practice in a number of ways that is not, to my mind, it goes beyond the superficial. It is to do with learning process and learning respect and imbibing something that can, is becoming more and more difficult to hang on to. Um, and popular culture in the cities provide their own ways of, whether it's a painted teapot or whether it's a truck, they can find their way into students' work. Um, what about the artists? I think artists in recent years have also, like Adila Suleiman in Karachi, have learned to collaborate with the urban craftsperson on a basis which is definitely, um, it's definitely to do with mutual respect. With the craftsperson giving their input into anything that leaves that, that studio, that workshop, next and next. And therefore, when the works are seen in museums uh, across the world, there is um, credit given to every hand that has touched that work. Uh, one word about my own teaching. So who teaches the teacher how to teach? Um, it can be pretty proud. This is, this is, I'm sharing with you something that the Asian Art Archive helped to unearth in my archives. I had totally forgotten about it. <laughs> it was my day book when I was learning to be a teacher. And a day book at Korsham, where there was a very brilliant um, principal called Clifford Ellis, um, we were taught to sort of not just go into a classroom unprepared, but to think ahead as to what we were trying to teach. Um, and then you had, uh, this is from 1964, which gives you an idea of uh, just how ancient I am. And it's about you know, what one is trying to do through each class that one was teaching. What were the principles one was working on? Um, how would they be transformed by the materials that you offered the students? And also, what were your expectations at the end of it? What did you learn as a teacher? at the end of the sessions, forget about the students. It was far more important that you went away with some realization about whether you, in fact, were able to achieve what you wanted to achieve. Um, these are just two images of uh, working in an informal atmosphere. This was the city of Lahore, where very, there are very often children who don't get to do art in this classroom, and so for the summers, I got my students at NCA to work with children in a very, very old school. Um, and we got them to do work, but the problem was none of them had handled art materials before. They were tremendously uh, hesitant. Is that you? Yes, that's me, by the way. Yeah. John is amazed. <laughs> um, and this was, so then the next day we changed our tactics. We decided that we'd start with poems and stories so that they would realize that there was, they didn't have to necessarily touch those pristine bits of paper and pens or brushes or whatever. Most of them actually 
were not even acquainted with what the name, what the name of a brush is. One child was saying to the other, hand me that spoon. <laughs> and so it was a great learning experience for myself and for my students. Um, at an artist residency in Murray, uh, they are these nomad children, nomadic children who sell milk to the household. Well, once they've finished with the milk uh, job, they have time. So we would collect them and get them to work um, with whatever materials we could provide uh, for the duration of the residency. So the artists who were participating in the residency also then contributed to the art education of the children who were the nomads along the hillside. Um, everybody knows you use museums. What do children get out of museums? I love those museums which allow children to touch things. Um, it's so much more real. This is Lahore Museum. Um, and then the more well-endowed, privileged school, where you have an actual trained teacher who is telling them how to assemble, reassemble, take things to pieces. Um, but still, I think that the joy of discovery, of not doing the usual things, but taking up, taking your bicycle to pieces, can create wonderful works. There's the class. Um, this is a very recent, just finished uh, project that I did. It's so called OSH, which is our shared cultural heritage. It was in conjunction with Manchester Museum and the British Council, and it was with the students of the inner city of Lahore who also don't have any art in their curriculum. Um, they barely notice that they're living in the shadow of 17th century monuments, Mughal monuments. And the, the, the weekend program was all about introducing not only materials, but seeing where they lived, how the heritage was their responsibility. And, um, and not just young children. We had teenagers who were um, attracted by us, us telling them we're going to teach them how to make videos. So, and they could go on to Instagram. So we had one young woman who wanted to be a traveler on a motorbike in Pakistan, and she wanted to make Instagram stories about it. So she, we gave her the skills required, but also they enjoyed. So this was a multi-age uh, group uh, from small children, next, uh, to young men who were actually students in madrasas, uh, but also wanted to learn how to make videos. Then street children, uh, who work in the parking lot, minding cars, um, drawing on the streets with them. I'm just leaving you with the last image, which is from one of the workshops uh, from the inner Lahore, from the young children there. So I think I've said enough. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sonia. Uh, and uh, I'll pass the mic now to Chen, and then afterwards we can reconvene for conversation. Give me a minute. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, thank AAA and John and other uh, staff of AAA arranged this program and invite me to uh, uh, Carcel which uh, I feel very close to. Uh, I, I had some relationship with Documenta from uh, 2000. I organized uh, the curator's trip from uh, the Documenta 11 uh, for their, those uh, curators to visit China. And I accompany them for uh, three weeks, visit uh, Shanghai, Beijing, Hangzhou, Guangzhou, Hong Kong, and the Taiwan, Taipei. Um, then also I come 10 years ago, uh, the document um, 13, right? And uh, joining some program. So I'm really happy to be back. Uh, thank you. Uh, a to arrange this. Uh, I'm told there are probably 
more than 700 artists participating in this document, uh, probably 1,000. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm pretty sure I am one of the eldest. So today I want to tell you the story of uh, an art school in China. Because uh, I study in the school and I graduated and t taught there, I spent more than 30 years in the school. And this is uh, uh, China Academy of Art, which is one of the most important art institutes uh, in China. Um, I think this art education uh, in China it was very much like reflect to the changes uh, throughout the time uh, in this institution. So one school, you will understand if you um, learn the story about uh, the development of the school and probably will get idea of what's art education in China in the last uh, uh, 50 years. Yeah, this, the China Academy of Art uh, established in 1928 by a very important uh, educator, Cai Yuanpei. Cai Yuanpei at that time was a, uh, the Minister of Education, but also hold other positions. He's a, he was the leader of a, a Chinese, uh, one of the leaders leaders of the new um, uh, educational um, kind of a, uh, reform. And uh, he find that he actually studied in Germany for some time. He uh, learned the very important uh, idea of uh, uh, what he advocated when he went back to China is to, uh, he want to use the art to replace religion. And uh, so he was um, a founder of this art school. He uh, himself even selected the site for the school. Uh, at that time, China was a, a kind of in chaos because of the civil war, because of the, um, in different area, everywhere, uh, every uh, province or city was uh, controlled by one uh, warlord. And at the end, there was not um, uh, centralized at that time. So Cai Yuanpei believed that in, at that time in northern part of China, was not a good place for art education. So he decided to uh, set up this new school in Hangzhou. And he uh, find that it's a beautiful um, existing building for uh, near, the, just a, uh, near the West Lake, beautiful lake, and they decided to uh, use this building for the new academy. You can see that in the picture. And um, you read this, um, tell you in page, um, uh, when, when we had that as a opening ceremony. Can you go back? Okay. Yeah. On March 26, at the opening ceremony, Tai Yanpei said, establishing the Art Academy at the West, West Lake to create the beauty so that people in the future would change their mind from believing uh, superstition to loving beauty in order to truly complete their lives. Uh, so that's a, the basic idea, and he find a very um, promising young artist, Ling Dongmian, which uh, who, who he met in uh, France, uh, to be the president, the first president. Ling Dongmian at that time, I think, is only 24 years old, very young. So he come back 
uh, from France and become the first president of the academy. And even the school was based uh, on the system, European system, like uh, the next slide. Yeah, it's all the uh, kind of a traditional uh, training uh, in the aca European academies. So use the same method, uh, drawing, uh, the basic training uh, in like anatomy or uh, color uh, composition theory. So very much the same as what did they taught in the French or other European schools. But the, the principal, the, the, the uh, president of the new school, Lin Feng Mian, was kind of a, a radical artist. He much more influenced by the modernism. Uh, so he brought back actually uh, a modernist approach instead of uh, just a traditional uh, academian kind of a style. And Hangzhou became one of the first art institutes in China to promote uh, a modern, modernist art. Uh, he and uh, his colleague, mostly from France, uh, uh, or some uh, professor from uh, Japan, uh, studied in Japan, uh, he even hired some foreigners at that time, Russian and uh, uh, French artists to be the, uh, to join the faculty. Uh, so the Hangzhou Academy for the, in the first 10 years under the leadership of Lin Feng Mian was quite uh, radical. And that all happened before <laughs> I went to the school. Uh, I didn't uh, really uh, personally uh, learn from Lin Feng Mian and the other uh, professors. I met some of them. I even met Lin Feng Mian once. But when I come to the school, it's already changed to Russian style. So I'll tell you about how this happened. I think politics uh, influenced the school, the art, system, the art education system quite profoundly. Uh, when China, uh, the People's Republic of China established in 1949, the government actually immediately took a policy they called the Ling on one side. So everything we have to learn from Soviet Union uh, in uh, building the industry or even the agricultural system, everything have to learn from Russia. So as art. So the art school have to change from this uh, uh, their French system to a uh, Russian system. Um, all the, uh, the courses, uh, even the, um, the, the uh, school system like, uh, uh, from 1950s, uh, did it divide to like uh, the painting department has to divide to uh, oil painting department, print made, printmaking department and sculpture department. Those all follow the system of academies in Moscow or in Leningrad. I give you an example how, how much we have to follow the Russian uh, system. Is um, The schedule, teaching schedule in the academy, um, they changed uh, from like a normal teaching uh, schedule, like uh, four courses in the morning, three, two, two or three uh, classes in the afternoon. Uh, that's because uh, in, in China, every university, uh, yeah, they have this uh, system. But they, in Russia, it's uh, different because their climate, they have a much long, uh, 
a short day and a longer, uh, like a evening or a dark time. So their courses is only like uh, concentrated in uh, from maybe 10 o'clock to one o'clock. Mm. And the other time they can do it, mm. especially studio work, mm. you cannot paint. Mm. But the we live in Hangzhou, or even our some school, like Hang, uh, one academy is in Guangzhou. Our climate is totally different. We have a long days, we have a bright sun, but we have to follow that schedule. We change it to <laughs> five, we call the five hours system. This means we only have classes from 10 to 2. And then after that, there is no class schedule. Mm. So it's a blindly follow the Russian system. And I remember, because there's a long, like five classes a day, uh, continuing classes, students get hungry. He, there's a no lunch break, right? Mm. Students get hungry, so they didn't have energy to keep <laughs> learning. <laughs> then the school have to provide some snacks uh -huh. <laughs> between uh, two classes. Then they will give you free snacks, like some bread and dojang. Uh, oh, uh, <laughs> soy milk. Yeah, yeah. Soy milk. Yeah. It was a, a kind of a benefit from <laughs> this. Uh, changing of the system. Mm. But it was very stupid because we waste <laughs> a lot of time. Uh, so when I was uh, a student in the academy, I went there in 1953. I was only 15 years old. Um, but first we will have to uh, follow this uh, Russian professor uh, called Chistyakov. Uh, Chistyakov is uh, actually, uh, the, before the revolution, he was a professor of uh, uh, the old uh, Russian academy. But his uh, system was uh, implemented to the later period. So we have to all learn this, uh, we call the Chistyakov system for drawing. And our professor who studied in Paris or in Belgium, they taught, they, they uh, uh, used charcoal to do drawing. But uh, in this uh, Russian system, we have to only use a pencil. So it's very slow. Mm -hmm. you, you do a drawing for like three weeks, you make this very detailed uh, life drawing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you don't, uh, the teacher actually at that time, everyone has to change their own style to follow uh, this new system. And uh, some teachers, because they they are um, they learned in different different schools, a different country, um, to change this is quite difficult. You, as an artist, you will know it. To change your style is not easy. So the school, uh, the government actually organized several workshops, workshops to have the student from all over China, all different schools come together uh, to study this system. There were uh, printed textbooks and uh, hired instructor to teach you step by step to learn this Russian stuff. Next one. And, uh, the highlight of this uh, Russian influence is a, a professor from Moscow called uh, Maximov. He came to Beijing. He was invited to Beijing in 1956 to teach a class, uh, also a, a, like a special workshop uh, to train Chinese teachers. Uh, the, also, the member of this class come from all other academies like Hangzhou. Four of the teachers were selected to this workshop and to learn all study with Maximo for two years. So everybody learned first 
like uh, uh, hand learned this is Soviet socialist realism. This is one of the teacher, Wang Chengyi. Actually, he was my teacher. When he come back from Beijing, I was the last year in the academy, so he become my instructor. And I learned as a second-hand Soviet style. Um, I think, and, you know, don't make it wrong. I still, I kind of a, uh, like, enjoy uh, looking at uh, Russian, many Russian artists. I think they are great artists. But I start to actually, uh, when I look at everybody using the same style to paint, I started, quite, started to question it. Uh, even there are so many masters in uh, Russia or in Soviet Union, like Retin or Surikov or Serov, Levitan, all these artists, we admire their work. But how can we take their style to paint China, mm. to paint our peasants, to paint our workers or anything we want in China? Like uh, at that time, for example, the landscape um, in almost all the academies, they would say that the highest um, level of landscape is have a silver gray tone. They say this is the highest level. You have to paint the landscape look like a gray, greenish, like silver. Uh, but this is a Russian, Russian landscape. It's not China, right? Because they had the very uh, uh, cold weather. They have a lot of uh, clouds and uh, very little sun uh, light. And uh, so they paint, the painter in Russia using that color tone to uh, express themselves. But in China, we couldn't use the same color to paint China, uh, especially the, the all uh, different areas have a different climate, different uh, color. And I, some students like me, we, we start to question our teacher, say that as an artist, we shouldn't uh, just copy other artists' color or any other style. So this start to uh, change, the situation start to change in mid 1950s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, this is a, a picture of the classroom. You can see it's a very typical uh, kind of a light painting class. Uh, next one. I show you one of the work I did in 1958 for my graduation. This is another work. It's a, just a re, reproduction of that work. Mm -hmm. Because the work in the middle, this piece was my uh, graduation, one of my uh, graduation project. This showed as a, uh, in the countryside, the, the kids uh, join, uh, the, like uh, irrigation mm -hmm. to uh, take uh, water to the land. Uh, that was uh, one of the things I saw during the, what do they call the great, great leap forward mm. movement. Mm. But the, paint, the painting was published, uh, it was praised by a teacher, and uh, you can see it's kind of a Soviet socialist realistic style, mm. uh, but painting was missing after a while. I lost this painting. Mm. So last year, uh, when we all locked <laughs> at home because of the COVID, mm. I start to uh, work on this in series called The Lost Paintings. So this is the first uh, lost paintings. <laughs> I recreated the painting in the middle and the pen myself. 
-hmm. with a picture. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, just uh, as a record uh, of uh, my own uh, learning history. Mm -hmm. Next. In 1956, there was a major event took place in China. It, we saw a huge art show from Mexico. It was a very uh, surprise because uh, there, in 50s, 60s, there were some art show from foreign countries, but not major. In some artists, because most of the show was a kind of a uh, diplomatic event, you know, because there's a cultural uh, uh, exchange program between governments. But this Mexican art show uh, was not sent by Mexican government, but it's a, it's a left wing artist group. Mm. Um, they sent this uh, 138 paintings and the 258 the prints. So it's quite a large show. Uh, I remember that was in Shanghai Exhibition Hall. All the students was shocked to see uh, so many good artwork and very strong, very powerful, but nothing same as what we learned from Soviet Union. Mm. So each artist have their own individual style and that they have a different way to impress them. Uh, some may use uh, uh, realistic still, but the, some use uh, other uh, modernist approach. So the show like this really uh, left a very strong impact among students. I was one of them. Actually, I be believe there is, besides Soviet uh, realism, now I saw a good sample of how artists should do. You have to have your own style, which reflect your culture, your history, and the, it's a, it's a different with uh, what the other artists do. So I think that was my, um, the beginning of uh, uh, changing the direction. And uh, many of my generations, uh, not only influenced by uh, Mexican artists, also influenced by like a Vietnamese art, we saw a very good the Vietnamese show in the same mm. same year, mm. uh, and uh, we knew that not just uh, one answer in art education and art uh, creation. There's many many possibilities. Mm. Yeah, um, at the same time, there is also other uh, opportunities come. One is uh, China start to invite the, the artists from different countries. Uh, one very important event is there's a Romanian artist, uh, Eugene Popa. He come to China in 1960 to 1962. Uh, yeah, uh, also taught two years, like uh, that Russian artist Maximo. But he was a, uh, actually then, uh, you know, in the in, um, archive, we find that, that uh, information. China, at that time, the government wanted to invite the second Soviet artist to teach a workshop. But then China and the Soviet Union split up because of the political differences. Uh, then the government uh, changed uh, their plan. Instead of a, another Russian artist, they invited this artist from Romania. But uh, Popa was uh, trained under the influence of modernism. Mm -hmm. His teacher was uh, from Paris. Uh, so he brought the idea and his teaching method, of course, is very different with uh, uh, Russian artists. So in, in China, the students, which also come from all different uh, schools, uh, actually learned from him to resume the modernist 
uh, legacy, like in Hangzhou. Mm -hmm. Because we stopped like from 49 to about 60. That's not, no modernist artists uh, were allowed to teach. Lin Feng Mian, Wu Da Yu, and some artists uh, were kicked out from school. And even I knew there was the artist like this uh, was arrested in prison because their style called the new style. But in 1960, early 60s, this kind of a connection resumed. Mm. Yeah, this is one of Popa's uh, painting. He painted uh, the portrait of Pan Tien Shou. Uh, Pan Tien Shou is a great uh, ink painter and also was the president of Hangzhou Academy in 1960s. Uh, even they, Pan Tien Shou didn't understand uh, foreign language, of course, uh, no Romanian. And the Popa couldn't speak Chinese. But they have a lot of things in common. They always, they spend a lot of time together mm -hmm. using all the way, including, of course, some time of help from a translator. But that their art have something in common, so they couldn't understand each other. Yeah, we could see from this portrait, Popa painted the background using Pan Tien uh, painting mm. as a background. Mm. And he did very well, or very well. Mm. He's a brush strokes, he's a, like a very well trained Chinese uh, artist. Next one. Um, also, we uh, China at that time sent artists to uh, other countries, and mostly Eastern European countries, mm. like this uh, Su Tanxi from uh, a study in Germany, in uh, study printmaking. Mm. Um, he brought back uh, also new new teaching approach in Hangzhou, especially the way of drawing, mm -hmm. uh, he called the, the structural, yeah, st st structural drawing, mm. uh, which became very popular at that time, not only in Hangzhou, but spread out mm -hmm. in other schools. Yeah. There's some paintings uh, when uh, during that time when I was uh, influenced by Mexican art, by uh, Romanian artist by uh, teacher from uh, Germany. I uh, I gave up the Russian realistic style and uh, using more like uh, uh, the, my own idea of how to um, express myself. And I went to uh, especially I spent some time in Mongo in the Mongolia. I painted a lot of Mongolian people thought that they could kind of uh, have same um, what I want to find from a human being. This is the, my second lost painting. <laughs> yeah, this is the painting I made in 1964. It's uh, about my uh, experience in, in the Mongolia, in the three girls, uh, uh, come to visit this uh, grandma, like a, a lady. Uh, he trades them in the kind of the tent. Mm -hmm. And the, the painting, I, when I create, I actually, I learned a lot from my teacher, another uh, professor study in Germany, Liang Yunqing. He taught us how to use the mural technique to do uh, uh, oil painting or acrylic painting. And this painting was shown in the national exhibition in 1964, but also was after the show was missing. Uh, someone criticized the style because it was not favored by the government. Uh, and uh, after the show, I never get this painting back. So last year, I recreated the painting and uh, add my own <laughs> portrait on it. Yes. 
and then start the cultural revolution. So uh, this is uh, uh, the third period. I say my first period was uh, Soviet socialist realism. And the second period is start to uh, learn the modernist approach. And the third period actually is all uh, that kind of an experimental uh, the learning all stopped. You have to only paint the mouse portrait or a propaganda poster. So we all learn how to do the poster. Next one. And uh, one of the paintings, this is my third last painting. <laughs> I made in 1968. Uh, <laughs> uh, at that time, as I said, you only can do mouse portrait. So well, I was um, asked to do a, a painting with Mao image. And uh, I found that this is an interesting composition. I don't want to do exactly like the most uh, realistic posters. I want to have a little bit kind of imagination. So I put Mao in a high, very high position, which uh, like uh, from uh, a mountain or from some uh, high spot, then you can have a, like a bird's eye view of the whole China. And I thought that the idea was uh, new, was uh, interesting, uh, but I was not allowed to paint Mao because I was uh, criticized as a bourgeois, <laughs> like a, a decadent artist. Uh, only uh, let me paint the clouds on the background. But the painting became quite popular during the Cultural Revolution. It was printed like a thousand, uh, like a hundred copies. Then they reproduced in many cities, like railway station or People's Square, all these places. But uh, eventually it was criticized by Jiang Qing. Mm -hmm. so, uh, because Jiang Qing didn't like the uh, theme of this painting. The painting is a Mao investigates south and uh, north of Yangtze River, which that visit actually was the time when Mao criticized Jiang Qing and other left-wing uh, leaders. So Jiang Qing didn't like the, the, the content, and he said, this is not a good painting, you shouldn't uh, uh, publish and distribute. So the painting also missing. There was an, uh, there's um, a collector, uh, Uri Sik, a very famous Chinese art collector. He always asked me, Shan, where is this painting? Uh -huh. <laughs> he wanted to put in his collection. I said, I'm sorry, the painting is lost and I don't want to reproduce. But instead, I did this painting called Lost Painting 3. This is the painting. Instead of a Mao in front of the clouds, I paint myself. Uh, after the Cultural Revolution, the more uh, new uh, teachers uh, were invited. Uh, one of them is a Zhao Ji. Uh, Zhao Ji from France. He was uh, from Hangzhou a long time ago, uh, in like the 1940s. Uh, great, he was a student of Lin Fengmian, but he went to uh, Paris and become a quite good artist in France. Was recognized as one of the um, early like abstract artists. He was invited back to Hangzhou in 19. 85 uh, to teach a, a class. Uh, at that time, I, always, I was already uh, the chairman of the oil painting department, so I, he uh, called me uh, boss. And when he arrived, I told him, as usual in China, when we organize this kind of a workshop, we always uh, 
invite the teachers from uh, other schools. Like uh, in China, it's about a dozen of art school uh, is uh, kind of uh, in the same level. And we always have a, like choose one or two teachers from one school. So in that way, when the workshop finish, they can bring what they learn back to their school. This is the way in China to, uh, to strengthen the influence mm. of those foreign teachers. Mm. So for Zhaoji, we organize it the same way, like a Russian artist or a Romanian artist. But he didn't like it. So he immediately get very upset. And he said, Shan, I don't want to teach teachers. Mm. I want to teach students. Mm. And, but we couldn't change it because this is from a government arrangement. And the, those teachers already come. Uh, we cannot send them back. So I was really uh, worried and uh, couldn't uh, find any way to <laughs> to make him uh, make Kazawuji agree. Mm. Uh, so eventually, I, I come up with the idea of uh, uh, I say we make a mixed class. You still need to teach those teachers, but I will give you my student mm -hmm. to join them. So at that time, I was teaching in the, uh, uh, the fourth year class. So all the uh, students, about uh, 12 students, joined the class with other teachers. So then he was uh, happy. He was uh, started to teach. And um, so Zawuji's class, it was the first one after Cultural Revolution. And um, we also invite a, a Bulgarian artist. The next one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Marin Valbano to teach tapestry. Uh, in China at that time, contemporary art is still not allowed, especially in the academy. Uh, you were not allowed to teach uh, contemporary any uh, contemporary approach. Like there was no installation, uh, no um, new media, still traditional painting, sculpture, print making. But uh, uh, Varbono find a very good way to <laughs> introduce contemporary art. He set up this uh, tapestry studio. In, in China at that time, you still think tapestry is a craft. Mm -hmm. So in crafts, there is not so much like censorship. Mm -hmm. They will allow you to do it. So because actually- there's no content. Yeah, there is no content. So Varbano taught uh, a group of students how to make ta tapestry technically, but uh, also at that time, give them an idea of how to make a contemporary work. So one of the artists from his class, Wu Wenda, then become very important contemporary Chinese art. And also some uh, artwork from this class was the first <laughs> exhibit outside of China. And they even get an award from a tapestry pioneer in Switzerland. Because those uh, uh, influence brought from outside, so Hangzhou uh, returned to its position in China. It's more like avant-garde uh, art institution than any others. Uh, in 1985, what we call the new wave movement, uh, many of the artists uh, come from Hangzhou. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a group of Hangzhou artists was uh, with uh, curator Li Xianting in 1988 Huangshan Conference. And also there was a first couple of shows of contemporary Chinese art outside of China who were majorly uh, presented the artists from Hangzhou. Mm -hmm. So now this is a, a brief, very brief history of one art school. Now Hangzhou, the, the China Academy of Art uh, 
has been expanded dramatically in the last uh, two decades. Uh, when I was a student, we only have like 200 students in the whole academy, but now they have more than probably 20,000 or 30,000. I don't know the exact number. And uh, their campus, uh, besides Hangzhou, Nanshan Lu, the main campus they built, the Shangshan campus, built uh, uh, Shanghai, uh, Zhangjiang campus. And even a new campus, the Liangzhou campus, is under construction. The school became a huge, uh, like industry. Um, I, uh, one side, I, I think I uh, like to visit those campuses because of the architecture is beautiful, the facility is great. You never dream an art school can have this kind of a facility. Uh, the, uh, there's a photo show this campus uh, in Shangshan even get an award. It was like a, a select as so one of the 10 uh, best architecture in the world, something mm -hmm. like that. But uh, I, in the other side, I really have a question. Mm. Should the art school have that big size? Mm. And do we need to train like tens of thousands of artists? I think still I miss those smaller size. Mm. I think uh, for other education, we don't need to mass produce. Mm. We have to teach individual. And so it's, uh, uh, it's not elite, but uh, it's a uh, uh, more personal uh, way of training. This is my idea of art, art uh, education. Um, I don't understand how can you train a class which has uh, like 100 students together. I really feel sorry for the teacher who <laughs> is facing hundred students at the same time. That's it, I think I will be. Thank you, uh, thank you, Shen, and thank you, Sonia, for those uh, really uh, interesting and uh, thought-provoking uh, presentations. Uh, I'm conscious of time, and uh, we, uh, we're scheduled to end in maybe just a few minutes, but actually maybe we can go a little longer, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, so we, we can go on for a little longer. Um, but, uh, so I, in the interest of leaving as much time for all of you in the audience, um, I, I just want to kind of maybe um, ask very quick questions. And I think that one thing that both your presentations did uh, in, in their different ways made a case for individual instruction or individualized instruction. Um, so that, that was kind of, um, you know, I think a commonality between them. And another one is I think the way that they each um, uh, emphasized maybe the similarities but also differences or the uniqueness of the situation. So in both your cases, uh, you're in, whether Pakistan or, or China, you're talking about the way that um, art instruction, art education, is part of a larger project of nation building, which uh, has a very particular trajectory. Uh, and um, in the case of Pakistan, in the post-colonial context, and in the case of China, in the case of creating a whole new nation, uh, or recreating a whole new nation. Um, and I think something that's interesting is the way that you know there is this kind of uh, triangulation, because it's like, the post-colonial situation, but also the way that in the case of China, it's a, a reminder that it's not just the West or the East, it's not just Asia or Europe, there's also the, um, the Soviet bloc, the Eastern bloc, right, which was a whole other kind of um, uh, uh, alternative, let's say, system of education. And the way that um, each of these uh, societies are not uh, identical to itself in some ways. They're always already in conversation and dialogue with other, other societies and the kind of the modes of education reflects that, right? 
Um, so I, I think that one question I had for, for you, Salima, I was wondering if you could say a little about the way that um, that, that sense of the individuality that you're advocating, you know, how, that, uh, how that reflects in how you teach um, both younger children and older ones. I mean, I think you, you discussed this a little, but I was wondering if, you know, is, do you think you would have taught that way if you didn't come from our education background? That's uh, a question for you, you know, or, you know, did that, was that formative, that experience of working with younger children and how you work with, uh, you know, college-age students, right? And then in the case of uh, Sen, I wanted to hear from you about the, the question of, um, I think you, you closed off with the question of the future and the idea of mass education and going from 200 students to 20,000 students. Um, and I was wondering if you could say a little about you know, how you see that, that future developing, because I think one of the things that we see a, in, in Documenta throughout is an interest in education and in a form of education as a form of resistance to that kind of commodification and mass production, right? And so I was wondering if you could maybe address uh, that. So I don't know who wants to go first. Uh, um, yes, I think you've touched upon something which is uh, absolutely basic. Mm. And that is what is the purpose of all learning. Mm. Uh, because for me, art education is not an end in itself. Mm. It is a way of locating yourself in the world. Mm. And if that is so, then you are building on the curiosity that a child or a group of people have about how they locate themselves in the world. Mm. And I think a teacher who is interested in nurturing that sense of curiosity will inevitably bring the child or the young adult or the old adult um, curiosity back to themselves. Mm. I think one of the most um, fulfilling things about being both an artist and an art educator is that you are constantly uncovering more and more as you work. And that goes whether it's happening in a classroom, whether it's happening in a studio with one particular individual, or it's happening as you work you know, in isolation. There is this constantly, constant peeling back and trying to go further and further and question follows question and question follows question. A lot of the time when I'm working with one student or a group of students, the fact that you have an absolute array of eyes and minds and experiences and hands, or in some cases, if one has a special a student who is working with the foot, you are arriving at pressure on a surface or whatever, uh, which is different in each case, each hand, each eye, each mind. And you, as the instigator, are receiving back those eyes, those minds, those experiences, which add to your own and enriching you as much as the discovery or the voyage that the student has. So the, the common uh, denominator, I think, all the time, is learning to locate the individual in the wider universe, in the wider context, and constantly this to and fro is what makes, um, makes something happen, makes work appear. I think that um, the pandemic taught us what you lose when you're working online. Mm. Uh, and that is precisely it, that you, you're handing out the principles, or you're handing out um, the program, but you are not either receiving back or being able to invoke that curiosity, which is so hard to do um, when it is being done through a screen. I know that the next generation will probably think that I'm talking through my, my hat or I, my, my total has been. But for me, that screen becomes a kind of a barrier. Um, on the other hand, one has a lot to yet to learn, so maybe. Thank you, Selena. Thank you. Thank you.
about this. I, uh, I'd like to um, tell you when I was a study uh, also a long time ago in Beijing in Central Academy uh, for uh, like in 1960s. I had really good um, experience of learning from Professor Dong Xiwen. At that time, uh, in Beijing, the oil painting department divided three studios. So each studio have a one professor uh, to be uh, the leader. Uh, then we only have uh, like uh, four teachers. So Dong Xiwen was the head and then three other teachers. And uh, the students, probably only 20 students or 30 students. That size, I think it's really good size for art education. You are in a small group, you know each other, you understand what you say, and the, the teacher understand what you want to express. So this kind of intimate relationship, I think is necessary for art. That's I, why I question is that how can you mass produce artists? In which way? You don't have this connection. You don't have this like heart to heart kind of a talk. You cannot talk to 1,000 students in one week or something. So I think now it's oversized education. It doesn't do anything good for uh, art. Uh, I remember a long time ago, many years ago, when I went back to Hangzhou, I talked to the president at that time, Han Gongkai. I said, why are you still, you, you always keep keeping expand, expanding, increase your numbers? And he said, you don't understand China, Chinese system, funding system. Because you have more students, you get more money from government. So that's why we need, we need more money, we have to get more students. Mm. So this has become kind of a, a, a game. Mm. And it's not for the sake of education. Mm. It's become a punishment, I think. You need more money, you, you, you then you give you more work. Mm. But you didn't turn out good artists. I think this is a kind of a greedy uh, attitude you cannot use for art education. Mm. So I would say, you know, of course China has a huge population. You have more young people want to study. Uh, but uh, I rather see a kind of a satellite schools mm. in the city or in the area, not uh, a mega sized big mm. campus. It's not army, it's not the industry, right? If a Hangzhou has a 10 art schools, each art school have a different style, have a different teacher, have different kind of atmosphere, I think a much better chance to produce good artists. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. I think that that's a really interesting point that you're making. I mean, not only because I think it, it touches on what Salima was saying about respect, uh, as being a kind of a, a basis for education, whether it's art education or education in general. But also I think, um, you know, one of the things that Ruan Grupa said about this edition of Documenta is that we're here to make friends, not art. But I think one of the things that you're pointing out is that, you know, the two go together, right? You can't have good art unless you have those kind of intimate relationships that is sustain and basically create the context in which you can make work, right, that is meaningful. Um, so that's a really interesting point. Um, I, I'd like to open up the floor for questions uh, because we have a lot of people and I'm sure that there are uh, questions from the audience, so. Yeah. Uh, there. Oh, there's someone. <laughs>
So the question is, uh, you know, in Pakistan there has been a tradition of the really best artists being teachers as well, and that seems to have uh, changed. Uh, and uh, so, you know, what does that what does that say about the situation? And then, similarly, in the case of uh, for ch uh, for China, has it been the case that you know really the best artists, the most interesting artists, have been traditionally or you know more recently teach or like his in the last few decades teachers, and has that changed as well? So, uh, I think that the fact that Pakistani art has made um, its mark internationally is precisely because of the fact that uh, what we call the academy, I'm using that in a wide, wider sense, is really sustained by artists, artists who are very often among the best um, practitioners. They have among their peers, there is this back and forth. They may totally disagree in what their practices um, convey or the materials they use or the way that they teach, but the majority of them are teachers. And that has really fertilized the next generation and then the next generation, the next generation. I'd just like to share two anecdotes. One is when the Punjab University Fine Arts Department started in 1940. Uh, the person who was chosen to head the department was um, a woman who was actually came from London. She was married to that, that time an Indian, Anna Malka Ahmed, and she was chosen to head the department. And as she was, she was told at the interview, yes, we've chosen you. As she was leaving the room, uh, the vice chancellor said to her, of course you know that you can only have female students. So she said, no, why? He says, because the reason we are starting this department is because we notice that female students have now started entering the university and they're cluttering up the more important departments of physics and chemistry and all the rest. And we think they should have a department of their own. So the fine arts department is what we think they should have. I mean, this is the British period, okay? So it's not even like post independence. Um, that's one thing. What it did end up in is actually training a lot of teachers. And therefore, um, when the women's movement came about in the 1970s and 80s, you found that women were in positions of power in almost all the university departments as well as the art school. So they, in fact, were the mainstay of the women's movements in the arts. They were very often the rebellion rebellious ones, and I think that they changed, um, they changed the context of art making in Pakistan, made the schools very much outward looking and responding to the socio-political situation. So I do think that artists, practicing artists who are in tune with what is happening in the country make the best teachers. Um, but also because they're in touch with what's going on and they're not in some little um, ivory towers. So definitely these cross currents make much more vibrant art departments and therefore eventually Recording a better progress. art movement. Okay. Um, other questions? Um, I actually always say that um, I don't believe art can be taught. <laughs> so you have a program right last year. Yeah, have an exhibition. Because I, I told my student, I said, if you have good talent, you don't need me to teach you. If you don't, I can't teach you. So there's a... <laughs> Uh, I think teacher is not that important for the student. Uh, I always emphasize, I, I say that what we do is uh, we create environment for you. Yeah. I want you to come to a place you can uh, see good art, you can see good artists, you can see good work or all the 
um, since you want to uh, learn to see, you always have an opportunity. So, the, uh, like the, the more opportunity you give to a student, I think they have a better chance to turn out to be an artist. So that's why in the school, I always uh, first emphasize the library. You need to have a good library. Otherwise, why they come to your school? It's not because of the teacher. It's because of the library. Mm -hmm. Hangzhou has the best library in China. We start in 1970, late 1970, when Cultural Revolution destroyed most of the books. So we organized the book fair to bring in the uh, art book from outside. So then, uh, we expand our library and become very popular. All the other artists, uh, you know, the students, the graduate students, the teacher, will come to Hangzhou just to visit our library. And you need a good library. You need a good uh, uh, artist in residence program. So it means you bring those uh, good artists, even they don't know how to teach, but that they know how to make their own work and they show example for the student. Give them a chance to visit the visit studio, to meet the artist. Uh, I think the more opportunity we create, uh, they could get a better education. So my uh, own idea is I think a teacher is more like an organizer. Mm -hmm. Now we could say oh, more like a curator. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not really, uh, I think those, uh, uh, old style teacher, they want to give you kind of a hands-on experience to teach you how to do this, how to do that. I think we don't need those teacher anymore. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that that was something, Selima, you were emphasizing, right? That it's not about the, the, the training or instruction of road skills, but really about the experience, right? And, and I, I know, Sen, you like to say uh, art can't be taught, and this is something that my colleague Anthony likes to say as well. So yeah. clearly you taught him well. Yeah. Um, but actually, I, I want to push back against that because I feel like you know something that you did do as a teacher is create that environment, right? I mean, without that environment, the, the people who pass through the school may not have uh, gotten to where they were as easily or as quickly as they did. I mean, in some ways, it, it required you to be there to create that condition, right? Um, no, or? Yeah, yeah, right. You do get, uh, uh, I, I think I, <laughs> in my um, teaching experience, is not the course that I give to them. Yeah. Is it the, how many people I can bring to you? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I was an agent. Mm -hmm. I was <laughs> more than a teacher. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think this quality is more important. Yeah. You know, if a, a teacher is all, just knows some knowledge, some technique, want to teach you by himself or herself, it's not a good teacher. Teacher have to bring a new word, a word to the student. Mm -hmm. Then you could be really influential. Yeah. No, absolutely. I think the teacher is there to ask questions, not to give answers. Uh, and when I say, any student asks me, how do I do this? I usually say, I don't know. Yeah. Um, it may probably make some big deal of a certain teacher who's at total wash <laughs> doesn't know anything. But primarily, the thing is, my job is not to give the answers. My job is to instigate questions. And uh, hopefully, uh, if they have the talent, they will find their own answers. Mm. And each will be a surprise for the person who instigated that first question. Okay, great, and we have a question here. Thank you. Um, thank you both um, for all three of you. This has been really great. Um, I know like a little bit more about um, history of art uh, houses. <laughs> um, I know a little bit more about histories of art education in um, Africa and um, I suppose in a lot of ways it was less, well in many instances it was less about promoting a certain style and more about 
um, restricting certain kinds of art, um, and then when art was introduced through colonial means, it was um, restricted to like crafting, which was seen as uh, lesser kind of forms. Um, and then also when, uh, when African people eventually did start learning European styles, there's kind of an argument for uh, how people appropriated um, Western styles and then turned it into uh, potentially what you can call a modernist, an African modernism. I still don't know if that is a useful thing. Um, but what I was so interested in was um, this Soviet uh, realism imposition that even changed like the shape of your day, even though it didn't make sense. And this idea of um, painting uh, maybe lighter or more colorful palettes into gray palettes um, and thinking about uh, what kind of effect that produces when you paint uh, something wrong, essentially, but then it, um, it produces some other kind of thing that's different to Soviet realism within Russia. So, I mean, I'm not sure exactly what I'm asking, but I'm fascinated if um, if there was ways of appropriation um, of these styles and that kind of worked within what was being forced into the education but managed to resist in, um, in different ways. I, I think uh, just uh, like I mentioned earlier, the I think I, I don't criticize like a Russian art. Yeah, yeah. I think the Russian art is great. And some Soviet artists are also very, very good, very good. Their work, some works, a beautiful work. I think just you cannot teach people, of, like frame them in a certain style. You have to do that. Do this color, you do this kind of a brush stroke. I think it, learning in art uh, is you show them the all kind of technique. If you don't know, you can bring in other artists to show them, right? All different kind of uh, approach, different way, different kind of a style. But only thing teacher need to do, you give a student the freedom. You have to give a student freedom to choose whatever he likes. But uh, unfortunately, like in Chinese arts education system, for a long time, teachers didn't give a student freedom. They very like to restrict their students in one way. So that actually hurt a lot of students kill a lot of talents. Uh, I tell you one personal <laughs> story. My wife, also a teacher in Hangzhou, uh, in 1980, she was a young, she was a, like a, a, among all the faculties, she was the youngest. So when new students come to school, always give her the class. She was a teacher. So Zhang Pei Li or the Huang Yongping or Gen Jianyi, Wu Sanzhang, all these uh, now very famous artists. They're all from my wife's class. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know any teacher like in China have so many famous <laughs> students. <laughs> so, and uh, AA actually uh, interviewed her. I asked her, what you, <laughs> what you taught at that time? Why those students like you? Mm. And uh, why they could uh, develop, you know, in the, uh, to have their achievement? My wife said that actually I didn't teach them 
anything besides giving them a freedom. That's the only thing you need. As a good teacher, you give your students freedom, then you let them in the whole very complex, the, the odd word to choose what do they want. I think that's right. Great. Uh, yeah, I just want to touch upon what you said about history. Because I think one of the things that has happened in recent decades is the fact that we realize that we've all been subjected to Eurocentric male histories of art. And the teaching of that history of art is not very old, in fact. So I think one of the things that actually the feminist movement did was precisely to ask the question that why have there been no great women artists, etc. Nita Farrell is here, and she's one of the people who really taught me a lot in the way that I search for alternative histories. And primarily it was the women's movement, but I think since then we've all realized that we've been subjected to certain ways of uncovering and looking at the past. And I think each one of us has to search and to find our own ways of looking at histories. And that is not history, but many, many histories. And I think certainly uh, students uh, in different parts of the world need to, and I think one of the wonderful things that Documenta has done, at least for me, is to introduce me to so many histories that I was unaware of. And uh, I've certainly become much, much more aware of how illiterate I am about history. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, five more minutes, or? Okay, so five more minutes. Any questions from Art, His Art Schools of Asia group? Any questions from? No? Oh, one question. point that Yulia is in addition to being a curator and artist is also a teacher um, and uh, so the question is uh, if you know the the emphasis uh, in art education should be on the formation of individual on the individual artist or the individual uh, person how do you reconcile that with the kind of like you know what we're seeing in documenta which is kind of emphasizing the the, the significance of sharing and collective uh, endeavors I think there's no contradiction between the two. I think that if you are um, an art educator, it's not only about art. It's about humanism, and it's about the fact that the artist grows out of a social and political context. And as such, they owe something to where they find themselves. And their work if it is work that it is of deep significance, will speak to uh, beyond their, themselves and their ego. And I think that the fact that they are, you know, as we told, a very large number of artists in this documenta, I think is, makes one think about how we can go beyond exhibitions which are about the stars of the art world, and they're more about 
what their contribution is to their communities and to the world at large. So I don't see a contradiction between teaching an individual artist um, and hopefully making them more humane and better able to uh, be part of larger sisterhood, brotherhood of humankind. I agree. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, I was this is what the, exactly I wanted to say is, uh, it's uh, uh, to become individual, become yourself. It's not like it become selfish. It's even uh, make you a more human, like you say. You more uh, connect with uh, community. I think that like in Canada, we always say, compassion is the best quality. How can you have a compassion? You have to be really, you emphasize your own individuality. Then you uh, uh, like other people. You will understand other people. Mm -hmm. So this is, a, yeah, not the opposite side. I think it's the same thing. Yeah, is I will say, teach art is actually, is teach human. So I think that's a good place to, 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 to stop. <laughs> and, uh, thank you, Professor uh, Zhang Xintian, and thank you, Professor Salim Mahashmi, for, uh, for your contributions and to the discussion. And thank you, everyone in the audience, uh, for joining us today. Um, I'm really so glad that you could make it, uh, despite everything. And um, uh, tomorrow we have a workshop, but uh, I'm not exactly sure how that's going to happen. So it will happen somewhere. We'll so happen somewhere. <laughs> uh, stay tuned. So okay, thank you all, uh, and uh, happy documenta. Okay. <laughs>